I've thought about leaving so many times in the exactly. last year. I thought, I, I thought Hi, I really thank you so much for joining us today, whether you're <laughs> online or in person. Um, my name is EJ, I'm from Backstage Niche. Backstage Niche is a community of the invisible roles that are backstage in theatre and we are all freelancers from non-white global majority backgrounds. Um, we have a few aims. Our aims are mostly to diversify the backstage theatre roles in theatre within the next five to ten years. Um, we do this through panels, so we educate young people on what these job roles are that are invisible. We do workshops, we go into schools, we work with theatres, um, and we also do mentorships. So if there's anyone that's already really interested in any roles that are from non-white global majority backgrounds, we pair you up with somebody from our database who has a little bit more experience and can give you shadowing opportunities or one-on-one -on -one mentoring opportunities. Um, the business was started by Sylvia, who can't be here today because very luckily she is in the Maldives on her honeymoon. Um, <laughs> but Sylvia has been working in the industry for 10 years and she discovered herself that there was nobody that looked like her. And so along the way on her jobs when she found people that she, you know, was like, oh, you are also from a non-white global majority background. She kept in contact and grew this database over time. Mm. Um, so as I said, I'm EJ. I am myself a freelance stage manager who's been working in theatre for the past seven years. And this is Effia. Hi, um, I'm Effia. I'm an early career stage manager. I've just graduated and I've started working in the industry this year. <laughs> so that's me. So to introduce the panel, we have Kelsey Acton, who's an inclusive practice manager. And then we have Kerry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Kerry. We have Kerry, who is a founding member and chair at MENA Arts UK. And then we have Daniel, who is a writer and co founder of Moongate. Thank and you, then sir. we have Athena Stevens, who will be joining us online. Unfortunately, Athena can't be here with us. So Zainab um, will be feeding in questions and filling in comments and answers from Athena. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we just wanted to talk about the panel name and why we've chosen Build Back Fairer. So Build Back Fairer was inspired by a campaign led by Creative and Cultural Skills. Um, they had a podcast that explores the impacts and opportunities that have been heightened by or arisen due to the pandemic. Um, I think we would all like to acknowledge what the past year, coming on two years, um, has been and the dramatic change that we have had since the last theatre craft, which was in 2019. Um, obviously, there has been a heightened awareness to several issues um, within the industry as well as within the world. But we wanted to take this opportunity to not dwell on that stuff. We want to acknowledge it and work out how we can move forward and how we can basically be better. Um, we know there are a lot of people who have left the industry they've realised that during the pandemic that maybe the accessibility for them wasn't there, that maybe the institutional racism w became so heightened for them, the awareness that they didn't want to partake in that any industry anymore. They are mothers who decided that they wanted to be with their, their families and that theatre wasn't allowing them to spend that time with their families. Um, and so there is a real demand for people working in these backstage theatre roles at the moment. But we don't want to go back to how it was. We want to be better. So that is what we want to talk about today. Um, how we can make the industry better for those who are entering it and how those entering it can also aid in making the industry better. Um, so we're going to go on to some of the questions we have for our panellists first. So... As we said, we're addressing what has happened, but we want to take a more positive spin on it. So coming out of the pandemic, what, in your opinion, are the challenges that are facing the industry today? And I pass it out to anyone. Maybe, Kelsey, if you want to give it a shot. Um, so I think the challenges facing the industry 
in many ways are similar to the challenges that we saw before the pandemic. I'm not really sure anything has like fundamentally changed and shifted in the pandemic. So I see in particular, I think a push to get work out fast without care and attention to like what human beings need and how we do the work um, and what the final impact on the audience is. I also think that we still struggle deeply with this idea that art in big quotation marks is more important than like the humans creating art and also the human beings in our audiences. Um, as somebody who works a lot in access, I consistently see people talking about the importance of the aesthetics of their art in ways that ignores the impact of like how staging things in a particular way can wildly exclude some people. That was yeah. Thank that was you. Daniel. Um, I think the challenges facing the industry now are the same as what, you know, as Kelsey was saying, we went in, you know, we had a traditionally elitist, um, exclusive, sometimes unwelcoming uh, theatre industry. And coming out of it, coming out of the pandemic, you've still got that, plus people have lost a lot of money. Uh, apparently, audiences generally are down 20%, apparently. So this is a challenge, and, and I think um, that there's, there's uh, obviously a temptation for producers, programmers, mm. to do something that's quite safe, that they think would definitely get an audience rather than take risks, rather than be inclusive. They're, they're, you know, the, 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 the temptation to cast TV stars. No, nothing against TV stars, but, you know... I, I just think in terms of making a more inclusive industry, those are the challenges, basically, and that has to be resisted, I think. Uh, I think one of the problems theatre had during the pandemic is, is they were going on TV with, with kind of, you know, I mean, I know, again, I sounded like I'm slagging everyone off, but, you know, kind of posh white actors going, you know, oh, theatre is essential. And actually, it's a turn-off for a lot of people, actually. And, and I remember I saw my friend, Sophie Cartman, who's a, who's a black actress who was work in front of the house at the National Theatre and had just been cast in a play at the National Theatre when pandemic, and they got her on one day and she just sat there saying, well, look, this is my life. And, you know, straight away, there's a person that I think ordinary people out there can connect with. And, and actually, the, the industry, although we go on about how undiverse it is, is actually a lot more diverse than, than we let on. The people working backstage are from all sorts of backgrounds, you know, and it is an industry which encompasses all kinds of, you know, it's not just fancy actors and playwrights. It, you know, it is, there's all sorts of people working there and I think that has to be kind of, like stressed more and 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 but th those are the challenges basically i think yeah um i think uh, that's a great answer then. <laughs> i think um i think our our challenge is our opportunity yeah i think what's happened is that we've all worked out we know a lot more mm. there's a lot more knowledge out there mm. we've reminded ourselves that freelancers are really important and they're really vulnerable in the ecology of what's happening mm. and we can't ever forget that we also know that a lot of big institutions got a lot of cultural recovery fund money and we should be able to hold them to account on what they're going to do with that money now mm -hmm. going forward. And we also know that people from the global majority mm -hmm. were adversely affected by the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Those are all facts which are out there. And we've had a year and a half, 18 months to stew on that, mm -hmm. to not forget it, so which means it's galvanised all of us to make the change that needs to happen, both as individuals, but also holding the big people to account. Yeah, that was brilliantly put. I also love how we actually went on a journey there through those answers, <laughs> going what the, what the problems were, yeah. where we are, mm -hmm. and what the opportunities can be in the future. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you. Riding off the back of that, what schemes, campaigns, and conversations have you had or have given you insight or hope about industry now? Um, if it could change and if Athena could um, respond to that as well, please. Athena actually said Kelsey's right in regards to art versus people and it doesn't just come down to capitalism and money. It's about accountability. How do we take great creatives in this industry but make sure they're held accountable when so many of us drift from one job to the next? Mm -hmm. It's about community building as well as realising that theatre shouldn't be a competitive free-for-all. Yeah, thank you. And I think that really nicely ties into the, um, the campaign of freelancers make theatre work. 
the people that shouldn't be falling through the gaps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so much, Athena. So, would you please repeat what that? Means? Yes. To repeat the question, <laughs> what schemes, campaign, and conversations have you had that have given you insight or hope about what the industry could or now change? I'll start. Yeah. Ooh, <laughs> um, uh, one of the one of the most exciting things that happened during lockdown, and it's a huge plug here, is that a group of us set up something called MENA Arts UK. Mm. Mm. And MENA Arts UK is a organisation for professionals working on stage and off stage, in front of the camera, behind the camera, who are connected to the Middle East and North Africa. Mm. So um, a whole bunch of us got together and were, were well, we're actually, we, we're kind of invisible, and we're invisible because we're different and we're not quite, not quite being at in any conversation. So if you're part of Mino Arts UK, you are from the, that bit of the world that people call the Middle East, which is problematic in itself. Mm -hmm. We know, <laughs> we try, we're working through that. But we're talking about sort of um, Western Sahara, up the, um, uh, up the top to uh, Turkey, Afghanistan and South Sudan. So that, that's the kind of area we're talking about. And, and we've come together in the pandemic and we've organised ourselves into being a membership organisation. There's a database, there's hundreds of people on it. So if you're trying to find a Sudanese stage manager, mm -hmm. if there's one that exists that's on our directory, you can find them. There's a, there's a, there's a mailing list and we're getting money in and giving it back out to those artists to help lobby for change to help set their own agenda around their own identity mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And that only could have happened because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that's a real positive that's come out of it from our, from our point of view. I think it did, one of, the, one of the silver linings is it did give people a chance to stop and think and regroup and connect in a way we haven't connected before because we were all going through such a hard time that you're reaching out for other people that are like you, that are also having a hard time and going, okay, how can we make this better to go mm -hmm. into? Uh, yeah, Athena says the network that I've been introduced to with regards to freelance and make theatre work shows the power of cross discipline in this industry. I also think the stage is doing some really important reporting mm -hmm. that's making a lot of people in power squirm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that because this pandemic gave me the opportunity to reach out um, mm -hmm. across borders. I joined a group on Facebook and um, Black Stage Managers in the USA. And if the pandemic didn't happen, and not that I wouldn't, but I wouldn't be pushed to do that and to cross boundaries and to learn from everyone else and see how they're dealing with the pandemic and how it's affected them in their career and in their lives. So that's me personally, that's how it helped me and that's how it platformed me and boosted me in my career because now I'm with Backstage Niche as well and they gave me a platform and now I'm working but you know <laughs> theatre's back so. <laughs> she also says we shall not be removed is really exciting it's a group of people with disabilities lobbying with change with change being crucial yeah mm -hmm. that's brilliant have you um Kelsey come across any other schemes that have possibly been or any conversations at Battersea Arts Centre about how um they can move forward post pandemic I mean, just organize my thoughts because mm -hmm. I have a tendency to try and like think five things at the same time. Um, so I think um, there's two things. Um, BAC is the world's first relaxed venue, which um, is a methodology developed by Tourette's Tom of um, Tourette's Hero. Jess Tom, sorry, of Tourette's Hero, which embeds the social model of access throughout the entire organization. And this includes making 90% of our performances relaxed. Um, so I was really heightened by, or really in some ways impressed by BAC's ongoing commitment to being a relaxed venue. We launched this relaxed venue and then literally a month later, everything shut down and I remember thinking, well, if this is the moment where BAC wants to like quietly get rid of this thing, this is the moment this will happen. And they didn't. I'm also, our artistic director, Tarek Iskander, um, uh, developed um, an entirely pay what you can season this fall mm. and we're continuing that into the spring season. 
it's very much an experiment. We're still trying to figure out like how this works. Can we keep it sustainable for the future? Um, but I think the boldness of that vision of saying people have lost their jobs, but we still need and deserve access to like brilliant art that will get us through that. And the way we can do that is removing this financial barrier um, was really wonderful. Um, and then lastly, I'm always inspired by disabled artists. Um, I think people who embed access as a given, so you're never having to ask for it or advocate for it or argue about budgets with people. <laughs> um, like that is always the thing that gets me through at the end of the day. I think that's brilliant to hear as well because in a world in which we could, we could think everything is about money going back into the industry because the industry has lost so much money, making such a bold move of, of pay what you can mm -hmm. is so important because if people don't have access to watch theatre, they're not going to notice the lights. They're not going to hear the sounds and mm. think, this is something that I might be interested in. How can I mm. get more involved mm. in that? So the first step is always getting people in the door. Yeah. And, and then we'll see how we, how we can <clears throat> support. Mm. That is wonderful. And I love what you were saying about um, um, disabled artists as well. Yeah. But I think it's also, and I think you might have some interesting comments on this, of also <laughs> the, the lobbying is wonderful, but it needs to be reciprocated. So what are, what are producers and, and mm. theatres doing so that they don't have to ask for things to be better for them? How, how, do, we, how do they be proactive yeah. rather than reactive? And I think starting up, for example, having a relaxed environment, and that is just the case. Mm. Yeah. You don't have to have artists come in, whether they be backstage or in, in, on the stage, and <clears> have to ask for that. That is something that is venue-wide, but there might be some other things that Athena might know of that, that theatres yeah. are doing um, to be proactive in that way. I think the, the, the relaxed performance thing is very important because I, I, I think theatre has always traditionally had this air of you, there's certain rules and you have mm -hmm. to know how to behave in a theatre. And I remember being at the, the Royal Shakespeare Company in the 1990s and there was a, a load of school kids in and one actress did say to them, you people have no idea how to behave in a theatre. <laughs> Which, you know, why should anyone, do you know what I mean? And, and look, 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 look I'm, I'm an actor. I want people to sit there in stone silence and, and hang on my every word and then burst out laughing at the tap when I do something funny. I want all those things, but, but if we want people in the theatre, we have to give them an environment where they don't have to know this set of rules. Um, in terms of things that, that I, I, I will give the Arts Council a big up, really, those kind of emergency funds they gave last year. The quick turnaround was very good. It enabled a company I co-founded with Jennifer Lynn Moongate to do a online digital thing called We Are Not Virus, basically in response to the, to the uptick in um, yeah. uh, racist hate crime directed at East and Southeast Asians and everyone, actually. Um, you know, and, and uh, I, I think that, that kind of quick response thing, I think, is very important as well. That, you know, we're used to a theatre where everything takes years to, to happen. And I will, they've got themselves in a terrible mess at the moment. But I will say the Royal Court, the living newspaper thing was extraordinary for that, mm. you know what I mean? And it, and it yeah. got... A lot of writers, a lot of directors, a lot of actors, a lot of designers working, you know, mm. on fast response things and, and kept people in the game. And I think that's really important. So it's those kind of things. And I think as well, Incarts have done some extraordinary stuff. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Parker and, and, and uh, freelancers make theatre work. All those things that I think are really powerful. Yeah. To expand on that as well, I actually got to work a living newspaper um, myself. Yeah. I was on edition five. And I would say that for backstage as well as all of the writers and directors backstage employed an extraordinary amount of people in a short space of time yeah. um, and gave lots of people work at a time in which they needed yeah. it, which was which is utterly incredible and they didn't lay their front of house off as well raw court yeah. so that's what well, yeah. you know and as you mentioned about ink arts another great organization mm. particularly if we're talking about mental health and protecting mm. our mental health after everything that we've gone through it's an incredible organization yeah. for that yeah. Athena says, everything we're talking about is front of house, that's a problem. So much of my time is wasted asking for my rights and to be respected rather than creating work. It's exhausting. I'm keen to make West End venues that have casts of 20 or more have to include at least one performer with a visible, visible physical disability. I have quotas, but I don't see any other way to change. 
I think that's brilliant. And I yeah. think if we're, yeah. if we're talking about visibility, um, which is part of this whole conversation, is that, and again, if you have to come, if we're trying to get people into the theatre, and we're doing pay what you can, and we're lowering prices to get people in, they then need to see those individuals yes. on stage in which yes. they relate to. And just to help us also, oh, yeah. if, you were seeing, <laughs> if you were seeing people on stage that you can relate to, the next step is we need to see the people backstage yeah. Yeah. that you relate to. You want, you want to see people with visible disabilities doing scene changes. Why can't they do scene changes? You need to see them, you know... Operating lighting. Operating lighting. You see them in the box. We need, to, we need to be more visible with backstage tours as well as on stage as well. Mm. Athena agrees. She says, if 20% of the population in the UK identifies as disabled, our shows in theatre are statistically wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Thank no, you, no, There's no doubt about that. It's absolutely correct. Um... And talking about our vision of what we now want the industry to look like, how do we think that our audience can help with that? How do we think our audience here, our audience at home, can help us in their small part to achieve that vision in the industry? I think, I think come and see the shows, first of all, and don't just go and see the things with big stars in, but come and see the shows and also demand more, demand better, like, like, like Athena said, you know what I mean? We, we should be seeing people with, with, with visible disabilities on the stage, and why aren't we doing it? You, you know, I, I think people... There's one thing that's clear about theatre, it's it's got a lot more difficult because people have access now to things like social media where they can write exactly what they think and it builds up. And obviously this is a nightmare for, for, for the people <laughs> producing plays. You know, it's, it's, it, you know, it's quite terrifying, I have to say that. But, but let's look at the positive thing. People can say that now, and I think as audiences, you've got the power to demand better, you know, and, and, and drown out the far right who are saying, like, there's too many black people on the stage or whatever, which is ridiculous, you know. I, th I, think, I think we can have the theatre we want, but we have to demand it, and, and that, that includes audiences. Mm. Kerry, any thoughts? I think... Um, I think um, audiences are smart. They're smarter than what we give them credit for. Yeah. I think we, um, we are playing it safe coming back out. I'm being positive, but we are playing it safe yeah. coming back out. And um, uh, what's interesting is what's happened to um, streaming on demand, the Netflix, the Amazons, mm. the, and, what, and what they're doing in terms of those... I, 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 I used to run the Theatre of Stratford East for 13 years, so I'm a theatre person, but I'm also now developing some TV film work. It's interesting having those conversations with those people who, make, who are the decision makers around that. All they want is the diversity of opinion and thought and um, in, in, in a writer's room, in, in a development process, because they completely understand that the more diversity you have in a space, the more everyone has to work harder mm. to make the thing more excellent and you don't rest on your laurels. Mm. And I'm, we're still in a place here where we, we play to the gallery, which is we play to the thing, which will be the quick fix and the immediate kind of response. Mm. Um, but we will get there as, as, as live art because TV and film are actually ahead of us mm. in the in innovation and the accessibility of what they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. I think I want to talk to the audience as in like new graduates and backstage folks. Um, I think I really want to say take care of yourself. Um, there was a massive piece of research that came out of Australia about a year before the pandemic came out that showed that mental health among backstage workers was like mental health diagnoses were much, much higher than the average population. This was in no small part, like very clearly from the research, exasperated by like long nights, the sort of transient nature of the industry where you work really intensely with people, but then you leave and you don't have the support system to call on. Mm -hmm. So I think first and foremost, take care of yourself. Um, I think as you're starting out, it's really easy to get scared because you want in so badly. Um, and I know that as somebody who, I'm working in my first theater job, I'll be honest. I'm 37 and I was told through drama school that I was there to be trained as an audience member, that there was no place for me. Um, and, sorry, where was I going with this thought? Um, so 
So I understand how scary it is to want to be part of something so badly. So at the very least, I want you to notice and note. So I want you to notice when there's a whole lot of global majority folks on stage and the, or in the, up on their feet in the rehearsal hall and the faces behind that table are entirely white. And I want you to notice when, um, shout out to our VSL interpreter here, um, when people expect VSL interpreters to walk into a show and deliver a performance, mm. like a performance mm. of every character in this show, and that production has not given them a single hour of rehearsal time with the cast. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, and I want you, I know your theater schools did not teach you to do relaxed performances. They did not teach you to work with audio describers or BSL interpreters. Um, they did not teach you how to ask other people in their rooms for at their access needs. But I want you to know that those are things that I all, I really need those to be part of your competencies and those things you take professional pride in. Um, and I really want you to learn those things. And that was a little bit of a speech, so I'm gonna stop now. <laughs> <laughs> that was a brilliant speech. <laughs> Athena also says, I've achieved a lot by writing emails and asking questions. What will it take for you to change? Why hasn't it happened yet? make artistic directors pinpoint exactly what the problem is. There's actually no problem, it's a lack of willingness. Mm -hmm. And then if they name it, we can work together creatively to change that. But no more of this, yeah, we want things to be different, but it's hard, or change mm -hmm. takes time, you've had your time. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Um, just to add on to that, um, one thing I've learned coming and graduating is that I'm going into an industry where I want to work. So by hearing people say, well, this is just how the industry is. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> We've been through a pandemic, everything's up in the air. So I have to form and change and question things when I just get pushed down and I'm like, well, no, that doesn't make sense. That was two years ago, <laughs> you know? We've got to think about things and make sure it's relevant to now. So going forward, it's just being brave being confident in myself because I wouldn't be here if yeah. I was not valid or if I was not able to. And mm. everyone makes mistakes. We're all going through this together. Mm. No one knows the yeses and the noes and the right answers. So, you know, we may fall down, but this is what I love about the industry. We're always there to pick each other up and we always want to succeed. It's like theatre. The show must go on. <laughs> you know? The show must go on. So... Just to follow up on that, um, why should people in the audience want to work in theatre? Because we need you to help fix the mess. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, no, I mean, it's, it's, there's a lot wrong with, 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 with theatre and, you know, we were talking about all those problems, but, but we all know, like all of us here, that, that when it works, it's, there's nothing mm. like it, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and it's, uh, and it, it you know, it sounds like I think it can change the world. Actually, mm -hmm. it can change yeah. people's lives. It can. It can. It can change communities. It can build communities. It can, you know, it 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 can make us more complete in a weird kind of way. And I think that's that's why. But I mean, we, you know, there was a time. I, I don't. You know, we we have an audience that, that's getting slowly older and older, and and uh, we 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 need we need. Youthful energy. We need youthful input. We need to listen to young people. We need to have them in the theatre and have them in the space. And and uh, we need to be more more. We need to look more like what the streets outside look and sound like. So that that's why you should come. Because like I say it's absolutely brilliant when it works. And, and and it works. It works if you all come. Yeah. Yes. Can I, can I just add to that and put yeah. a bit of cynicism in the room? Yeah. Go on. <laughs> no. I'm, uh, <laughs> which, which is. Please come and work in theatre, but also don't get... Everyone who's working in theatre now, no one, started, no one here who's got the power deliberately has done, has made it the negativity that we talk about it being negative. Yeah. Mm. We fall into traps that we are all responsible for and we all have to take responsibility for trying to change. A couple of those traps are 
we, auto we something inside us makes us think big is best. The bigger houses, the bigger spaces, the bigger budgets, that must be better theatre than the small thing, the, the, the discreet thing over here. Yeah. We love a five-star review and mm. we'll read a five-star review and we perpetuate the problem that I think is the biggest problem in British theatre is the critical debate around it. Mm. A small group of people are setting a level, a standard, an opinion about what is the great thing. And that gets perpetuated. It will happen again at Christmas where they'll do their top 10 shows mm. or their, their highlights of the year. And these people haven't gone out of zone one or gone into a certain bit of zone one and perpetuates this thing about this is the best thing. And the third thing that we do that we are all responsible for, even the young people, is that we go to those award ceremonies and we hear this must be the best thing in the world. This must be the best thing in blah, blah, blah. And they are great events, they are great shows. But all those are industry-led and the perpetuated thing about selling tickets. So a lot of great theatre, a lot of great shows would have never had a chance to be in that award ceremony, which is fine. But when the award ceremony says this is the best, it perpetuates a problem which, which leaves everyone on the fringes. Everyone doesn't look like that bit of mainstream mm. out, out, in the, out in the wilderness. And we facilitate all three of those problems, all, every single one of us, I think. I think going back to what we said about how can our audience help, look for the gaps. Mm -hmm. Look for what's not being given awards. Look for what's not being reported on. Look for those shows, look for those people. I found out today um, that there are, no, there are no accolades, there are no awards for movement directors. That was a fact of the day mm. that I've learned because yeah. of Theatrecraft. There are no accolades for, for movement directors. Movement directors are so important. They, it's different from choreography. They're showing how you should walk if you had suffered this injury from like five years ago. They're doing, they're doing those tiny little details and there are no accolades for them. So I think what you're saying, Kerry, about, you know, a small group of people are dictating these are the best things to go and watch. There's so many other little treasures or there's so many roles that you probably have no idea about. I, I learned today that there is a, there's such thing as cultural movement, cultural movement direction. Um, I've been in the industry for seven years and actually from before that, because I, I started as a child and I'd never heard that that was, that was a thing. So look for all the gaps that you might be missing. And one thing in our industry is you're never going to stop learning. Nope. There's, and there's never an opportunity where I don't know something. Like, I, I'm always wanting to learn. So find those places. Athena? Yeah, Athena says, I still can't get over the magic of theatre, as frustrating as it is. People breathing together on stage and off, problem solving with the slightest head nods in the moment, supporting and, ca and catching each other. That's how humanity should be when, as Daniel says, it, it works. Also... It gives us meaning. The work we do, oh, the work we do makes meaning out of chaos and tragedy. We need that in order to make life worth it. Without being to name trauma, horrible things get per perpetuated. We need those stories to know how to change and know what needs to be changed. It's at the heart of a revolu revolution. Also, if there were awards for movement directors, more shows would hire them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Athena. Um, Kelsey, have you got anything more to add? Yeah, I think I want to like vaguely pull together some of this stuff. I think for me the reason to work in theatre is always because story is powerful. Story shapes how we understand the world. Story creates possibilities. So our theater needs to reflect the world out there, but it also needs to be a space in which we imagine a better world. Because the only way we get better outside is if we imagine better inside. And like, the never ending narrative around disability is always that it's tragic, that you're broken, you're a especially in this country, that you are a burden. Mm. And disability arts, especially here in this like really magical city for disability arts, is about celebrating how, to quote Neil Marcus, disability is an ingenious way to live. It is an art. It is something like magical, a community. 
And I would have never had access to think those things or claim those things without disability arts and disability theater. So I would, I think you should work in theater to change the world and I'm gonna be a little unabashed about that. Effie, <laughs> <laughs> why did you wanna work in theater? Oh, as, as the youngest person <laughs> on the panel. I mean, I just saw someone walking across stage with a kind of headsets and I was like, yeah, I want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just being part of this industry, there's like what's been repeated, there's some magic to it. When it works, it works. It's just knowing that I am part of this thing, whether we were pulling our hairs out in rehearsal week or whether we were knocking heads, it, it's all a creative pot and loads of different people, backgrounds, coming together to make one thing work. And I just love being part of the process and giving to people. It's just sharing the joy with the world. Mm. That's what I want to <laughs> be here. <laughs> yeah, find spaces where your voice is important, for sure. Backstage, we are still part of the creative team. Stage managers are still part of the creative team. We're not just facilitators. So find spaces where your voice is also wanting to be heard. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's what I've worked out post pandemic is I only want to work places that value what I also mm -hmm. have to say. I'm not here just to facilitate your creative visit, vision. I also have a voice in the room. Yes. Um, just before we round up, has anyone got any questions in the audience? Oh, yep. Yeah. So to relay that question into the mic, so everyone can hear, um, <laughs> what our participant has asked is due to the recent cuts of funding in schools primarily, how are we then able to encourage the young generation, the next generation to get involved? I think um, it's a really good question and yeah, it's a really good. complicated and difficult one for me to try and work out. Um, I think the, the only bit I want to comment on is every time we say there isn't enough money I think we slightly put off the people in power. We give them an excuse not to first solve the problem. Um, that's the only thing I want to add. That's the, only thing, that's the only thing useful I can add to that, to that answer. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge. Um, I, I think, I do think though there's something in, I, I mean, the, the whole thing about school trips, it's terrible, it's been canceled, don't get me wrong, you know, and they're, they're you know, actively looking to, but I can remember being taken to the theatre when I was 14. It was the only time I'd ever been. I hated every minute of it. I didn't want to go back at all. Do you know what I mean? It was, it was when I was older and I saw something. Do you know what I mean? I think, I think there, is, there is something in theatres doing more outreach and, and making it more accessible in terms of, you, you know, pay what you earn. You know. yeah. Those are the things. That's the only way we can counter it. But there is also, obviously, a lot of protest that has to go on. You know, you have to protest those cuts. You, if you just roll over and die on it, they'll just keep doing it. That's, there's no doubt about that. And I think we all have to find a voice on that. And it's, that's not about being, you know, that, that, that kind of, in, in this day and age, that gets called, I don't know, Marxist or lefty. And it's not about that. It's just about like, like we want a fair country and we want a country where people have access to the arts from all backgrounds. Mm. Athena's final thought is we need your voice in this industry. We need you in this industry. Mm. I'm sorry the industry doesn't always reflect that but that's their problem if you are interested in theater on either side of the stage or in arts management you have a unique point of view that no one else can bring treasure that it's invaluable mm. Beautiful. Yeah. thank you thank you very much guys this has been enjoyable just want to say thanks to our sponsors white light for their kind donation and the royal opera house for having us today our bsl interpreters ali gordon debbie mcleod and susan merrick for doing a wonderful job <laughs> and lastly to all our speakers and volunteers from mousetrap youth forum that have helped run everything smoothly here in person and thank you for coming and um, fellow theocrat to Fearcraft to keep up to date with careers and offstage in theatre. Thank you very much once again, guys. Well, well done. Well done.